My dad said, why do you want to be up in the air? And uh, I said, because I like to watch the buzzards and the owls and whatnot just float around up there. And I thought, you know, that's where I want to be. Was up he said, well, you've never even been in an airplane. And I said, I know it, but that's where I want to be. To me, this is the best plane they ever built. I trusted this plane, I love this plane. I flew in it probably about five or 600 hours for about over about eight or 10 months. I could have flown all my life in a V-17. My name is Carl Jewell. I was born March 13th, 1926. You know, there are three children in my, our family that my mother and father had. My, I was the middle one. My older sister was two and a half years older. My brother was two and a half years younger than myself. I went to grade school when I was six years old, I guess, and I walked two miles to and from school unless the weather was real bad, then my dad would take my sister and I at the car. It varied, but some 45 to 50, 55 kids in that high school. Some of them came to school barefoot. They didn't have money enough to buy shoes. So that's kind of the way it was. It was during the Depression. We were on a ranch, and I was involved with working with my father on, on the farm right from the very beginning. I started riding horses at two, and I started working with the cattle, driving team and wagon when I was five. I started driving a tractor, I think I was seven or eight. And we had hogs, we had chickens, we had turkeys, we had cattle. It wasn't an easy, because we had no money. We, we had plenty of food, but no money. But that's how we were pretty lucky, because we had food and a shelter. And some kids my age hadn't either. At that time, I had a bad uh, job when I decided to enlist in the military. It, it was a terrible job. I worked in a turkey killing plant, and we had to help a farmer catch in these turkeys about daylight, and then we would take those turkeys in, and I stood right by the fellow that was what we called the sticker who killed the turkeys, and then I was standing there di dipping the turkeys into its water, hot water, so that the pickers could pull it. And we'd do that for six hours or seven hours. And if we could get in 80 hours a week, it would average a dollar an hour. It, it seemed like I was working all the time. And later on, long time after that, I went after I got married, my wife said, Carl, you've never had any fun, have you? You've never done anything but work. I said, no, I've never done anything but you were. I never did have, uh, I never had time to play very much or anything like that. I graduated in high school in 1943 when I was 17. I said, well, I'm gonna go into service because my classmates and friends are all in and some of them have already been killed. My mom and dad said, no, we don't want you to go. And I said, well, I'm going. I said, you can't stop me. I'm going to go because I said, my friends are already there. My best friend is there. He was a Marine. He survived Iwo Jima. And he said, no, we can get you a deferment probably because you're a farm or ranch kid. And I said, dad, I'm going to go in, period. And so I went down when I was 17 and I talked to the recruiter and I passed all the exams, and I, uh, of the three of us, I was the only one 
that passed. like I'm back in the movies again, don't I? Well, as a matter of fact, I'd like to do some talking. Yeah. Don't go away until I get this thing off. Now, it isn't as if it was a chore for me to talk to you because I want to speak on my favorite subject, the Army Air Forces. I can't speak from long experience. I've only been in the service a year, but I've learned a lot about what the Air Forces have to offer. That's what I want to talk to you about. I, I volunteered for gunnery school. Uh, I was actually I qualified as a pilot. And I was, but I, I got to thinking that the chances, as late as it was in, during the war and everything, the chances of getting through a flight school was pretty slim. And I didn't want to go through, get far away through flight school and then get washed out. So I volunteered then. And, as a gunner, because I wanted to be up in the air. And that's when I went to gunnery school, and that was, it took about three months. My first time in the airplane was that we were flying, and we looked down on the runway, and here come the ambulance and the fire trucks and so on. He said, well, somebody must be in trouble. And one of the other persons on the plane he looked out and he said, well, maybe it's us. We got an engine on the fire. And so we came around. It didn't amount to anything. But that was the first time I ever had been in an airplane our engine caught on fire. There was a few of the guys that said, boy, we're not going to go. We don't want to be in the air. We're going to get a ground job. They, it spooked them out. It didn't bother me a bit. We were at uh, Kingman, Arizona, and they just, just kind of looked at me and said, well, you're going to be a ball turret gunner because of my size. I went by the name of Youngin on the crew. I spent quite a few hours in the ball turret. Some of the guys said, Carl, there's no way you can step down into that. This is like stepping out into space. And I said, don't bother me any. I could do that. I just stepped right down and I had no problem with it. You have a that's just two sticks, and you can rotate them down, straight down, and you can rotate them straight up to a horizontal position, which is just, you can see the wingtips of the plane, and that's as high as you can go. Or you can roll them to the left or to the right, and you do it all with hand controls. And on the top of the hand control were the triggers, and also the, the mics, that, so you could talk to members on the, on the plane. One gun was about six inches from my right ear, one gun was about six inches from my left ear, and pointed, pointed right parallel was my body. It was cramped. I was too big to carry my parachute. I had my harness on, but I was not able to carry my parachute into the ball turret with me. So if something happened, it meant that I had to stow with the guns, which is pointing them straight down, reaching behind me, taking off my safety belt, and opening the hatch and straightening out and climbing up out of the well, out of the ball turret into the waist of the plane. And then hopefully I could find my parachute. The time he got to the waist door and bailed out, it would take probably a minute and a half. Some of the people he did, didn't have time to do that. And so the, we lost people that way. Oh, 
Hubble out at 2 o'clock, watch it. Got an engine on fire. B-17 out of control at 3 o'clock. Keep your eye on the road. See any parachutes, Quinlan? Come on, you guys, get out of that plane. Bail out. There's one. He come out of the bomb bay. Yeah, I see him. There's a tail gunner coming out. Watch out for the pilot. We were supposed to be going to Europe then. They started training us for coming right in on the ground and dropping a bomb in a insulation. And they canceled this out then because the war was going down and when it's, the Allies were winning. Today is victory in Europe day. Yesterday morning at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command, and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet I command. And so we started training then for the invasion of Japan. We started training to come in at treetop levels, and I would be on the bottom of that. And then we would probably not have had enough fuel to get back to a base, or we'd probably, we might have been able to go to China and, and bail out in China or lay, land in China. But if we landed in Japan, uh, there they killed us immediately, which they did on the crews that didn't make it. Like they gave us a 15-day leave before we went over. Yeah, I told my folks, I said, you've been real good parents to me. I said, I've had a good life. Uh, the way we're being trained, I said, I won't be coming home. Now they figured that there was probably going to be 450,000 of us killed if, we, if Japan was going to keep right on fighting. I knew that we were going to be do, doing it, but I didn't know when. But that was planned about for two weeks, roughly two weeks after they hit. But they dropped the atomic bomb. A bomb was finally released exactly at the designated hour, and the explosion occurred as planned. About two or three weeks later, Japan surrendered, and then we got to come home. I think it was September, September 2nd or something like that. They just broke up our crew, they broke up our squadron and, and transferred us out. We, we moved our planes out, and, and uh, that was it. I was 17 years old when I enlisted. When we were flying, I was 18. I didn't get into combat, but I, I got a lot of hours flying it. I had some good experiences, and I've had some bad experiences. I was in the ball tour. About the longest I ever was in the ball tour was about six hours. We did a lot of practice shooting out of it. We carried 1,100 and some rounds with two guns. They were about, the guns are about this far from my head. Just felt like so. I was a good gunner. I was a good knacker. And I like to be in the ball turret. Our whole team was very disappointed 
that we got turned down twice. Once going to Europe as a replacement squadron, and then the other one going to Japan as a as a uh, in combat. And we didn't go either. Now, our team was our crew, except for one man, was all disappointed we didn't go. One man, he 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 was kind of glad. I was used to having a lot of challenges. I rode bucking horses when I was 11, 10 or 11. And uh, when I got into the service, I had a lot more. But uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, I was kind of, I was pretty optimistic all the time. And I never worried, ever, never did worry about myself. And guy said, Carl, you got more guts than anybody I ever saw. I just, I said, well, if, if something's going to happen to me, it's going to happen to me. But I never worried about it. One night, I was flying back here at the night observation. And I was sitting in here, and I was watching for other planes. The pilot made an error, and he hit the bailout button. And I was here. It was plum dark. I didn't have any idea how, where we were. I had no idea how high we were, what our altitude. But I crawled back to the tail position, bailout position. I was back here at plum dark. I pulled these pins out right here and I was just ready to kick the door open. And I thought, well, never done nothing feels bad. The plane feels like it's flying good. Uh, it's how, uh, you don't see any smoke. Can't see any, is there smell any smoke. And I peeked around here. It's a little hard to see, but I could see lights up in the radio room. And I could see the guys moving up there. And they weren't jumping. So I watched him for a few seconds, probably a minute or two. Saw that they weren't, nothing was wrong. So then I tumbled around, put the pins back in here. Then I took my chute off. I, I had put the chute on and then I got stood up and then I saw them on the call that they said I was still on board. And that made the pilot happy that I, that I hadn't jumped. Occasionally, when we're flying, uh, take, after we've taken off, we cannot get the wheel uh, either up or down. And so you have to have somebody take, uh, do it down. Sh There was a, a short crank. On here, and you take, take turns, but one, one of us had to crank up or crank down the wheel, whichever had to be done. Cranking down the wheel is, it's pretty easy because you got the weight of the wheel to help you. But there's a crank right here, and you, you put one foot here, and you don't have the rope. You put the other foot over on the other side of the bomb bay, like this, and then you, you stand here and either crank, crank up down the wheel or crank up the wheel. Cranking down the e e wheel was easy, but cranking up the wheel was real hard. You had to wait. And if we were above 10,000 feet, we had to be on oxygen. The Germans learned that to, you know, the, the fastest way to knock down a B-17 was to come in from the front. You'd hear the term 12 o'clock high. That meant an enemy, what we call abandoned, was coming in 
on straight into it in order to try to kill the pilot and the co-pilot. Our pilot had each of us fly the right hand seat for a period of time so that we could keep the plane. If the pilot and the co-pilot were incapacitated, if they were killed or whatever, then one or the other of us in the, on the crew would come up here and take over as a, on the co-pilot seat in order to let the rest of the crew, those that are, weren't badly hurt or anything, could, could bail out. Yeah, they called me youngin' or kid. Nobody ever knew my name, I don't think, you know, on our crew. Yeah, they never, I never heard the word Carl, Carl any time I was in the service, I don't think. Kid, you do this. Kid, you do that. Or youngin', you know. And I always volunteered for crazy things. If I hit, they needed help wing walking where we'd have to stay out and watch we didn't go through a bunch of planes that we didn't hit the wing of another plane or a tail. So it, wing walking where I pulled the cogs behind the wheels and I had to walk right down between the props the propeller while they were running. And you had to be careful. You didn't deviate very far. This has been a lot of fun. There's a lot of memory here for me. During the summer of 1947, I had a, a lucky break. A friend of mine who had survived Iwo Jima, uh, he had worked for the Forest Service. He said, do you want to go to work? And I said, well, yeah, I'll, I, that's fine. I was what they called a smoke chaser, where I was by myself, but I'd put a, smoke, a pack on my back and go fight a fire by myself. One of the, the forest supervisors apparently was impressed with me. And in three weeks, while they made me foreman of the crew, well, he insisted that I, I go to college, which I did. And I got a degree in forestry and graduated on a Thursday, went to work full time Monday morning and worked for him straight on the rest of my career. About 1940, let's see, 1948 or 49, I. Uh, decided to buy some cattle and so I bought a few cattle and then I, this place, this uh, ranch here came up and I was able to buy it and so I had cattle while I was still working for the Forest Service then. and so and that was pretty hectic because I was up moving irrigation and what not four or five o'clock in the morning then going to work and then having to come back and feed cows or work here. So I did that for, until I was about 80 some, and I'm still doing it. This is all I know. That's the only thing I know now, is just working with cattle, driving tractors, uh, farming, uh, whatnot. And I've been ranching you know, basically all my life. So I spent a lot of time in the tractors. I just planted about 26 acres. I've got about 20 acres more to plant. I, I'm able to do some things at my age. How I met Carl is through being adopted by my parents, who my dad has just met you went to college with Carl at Oregon State, and then stayed lifelong friends, and I'm guessing from the day I was adopted till now, I've known of and had Carl in my life and I've been in his life. And as country folk, we all know that mentality and that's how things are done. If you're big enough to reach, strong enough to pick something up, then that's what you did and that's what you're expected to do is help and that's what he knows. And when we moved here in 76, 
and we're doing stuff on a ranch, Carl would come out and be one of those cowboys. Going back to who and what I am, being a Native American and working with the land, working with animals, and have somebody that had the same vision as I did is where I needed to be and go. And it was ironic our paths crossed to me finding a job and him needing an employee. Hey, Carl, as I know him, is a very unique individual. At 96, most people are in a retirement home kind of waiting to go away. Um, he's here for a man who still gets in his pickup, feeds his cows, calls up on his tractors, works his ground. It's amazing to see this man not give up. His passion is to be here and do what he's doing and, and you can see it in his actions, you can see it in his strive and drive and desire to be out here working this ground and, and I'm here to help him finish that. There's a picture above his desk in there of what this place looked like and it looked really good and green and this pond was doing well. And as you can see, it's different now than it was then, but I'm hoping to get it back to being like that for him. It's a neat and interesting story, just like you're saying, to seen and known and been around him as a little kid, uh, lived my life, moved through my life, and then to come across him again. And then, as mentioned earlier, we've been able to help each other. 50 years isn't very long. We think it's a long time, but it's not. I lost my wife. Uh, we were married just short 62 years when I lost her about eight, nine years ago. Well, my wife's name is Eugenia Jewell, or Eugenia Valine Jewell. And I said, well, Valine sounds like villain. I said, you know, I changed a villain to a jewel. <laughs> Sometimes she didn't get a kick out of that. We were going to Oregon State College and one of the things that we did, there's a place called Luther, Luther House, and we had a Christmas program. And uh, my wife, my girlfriend, or lady, I should say, I didn't know her very well. She said, Carl, do you have, you've got a car, haven't you? And I said, yes. And she said, would you take it over to the, pick up the laundry and stuff from the Christmas pro program and take it over to our apartment? And uh, I said, yeah. So I did, and anyway, I started going with it then. And that was at Christmas time of 1946, uh, 47, something like that. So we started going together, and we got engaged, and then in June of that year, we, we were married. And we had ended up with three, three children, her, her major was maternity nurse, so she delivered some of the babies. Actually, she saved my life twice, otherwise I wouldn't be here. The first time, I was up in the mountains and uh, my appendix broke. And so 14 hours later, uh, we finally got into Salem and I, I was operated on. And the doctor said, it's a good thing he's really tough in good shape, you know, otherwise he wouldn't be here. And then the next time was just a few years ago, and she, I was sitting there having breakfast, and she said, honey, are you, do you feel okay? And I said, yeah, I feel fine. She said, you don't look good. She said, show me on this chart. I said, well, I've got a little tingling in my shoulders. She said, show me on this chart. So I did, she said, we're headed for the hospital. She said, I, she said that she was driving, and she wasn't in good shape then. But anyway, I said, honey, don't drive so fast. She said, we're in a hurry. And I said, I said, well, I got things I want to get done today. She says, no. Well, she stopped it. I went into the emergency. Within 30 seconds, they had me on a gurney, coming up and cleaning, getting a, a clot out of my heart. She saved my life twice, but I couldn't see it, save hers. She had cancer and they, they just treated her for about four months, or, but it, it, she, could, she couldn't overcome it. It's the hardest thing I ever tried to do. I'd sit, she was in so much pain, and I'd, I'd sit and hold her for hours, you know, towards the last. But her, her mentality and everything was right up to the day she passed away. She was fine. Well, I'm real, I'm very lucky. I feel very, very lucky that I've been able to, to do what I've been able to do for so long. That's, that's where I really feel good about. 
that I can still do both mentally and physically. I can still do a lot and a lot more than people, most people at my age. Uh, and I feel real good about that. I don't always succeed what I'm trying to do, but I never give up. I never have given up in my life. I've always su either succeeded or something's changed the situation, but I never give up.